In this incredible story of survival, Brain on Fire, My Month of Madness, Susanna Cahalan pieces together her journey through an unimaginable horror from beginning to end. She endured an illness called anti-NMDA receptor autoimmune encephalitis. It can take a long time to be diagnosed and it is often misdiagnosed because this illness is very rare and has many symptoms that mimic other disorders. In Susanna's case, she was very lucky to come out the other side feeling like she had gotten 90% of her old self back again. Her disease process from beginning to end gave her a new purpose in life, and that was educating others. Anti-NMDA receptor autoimmune encephalitis is a disorder that caught the attention of Dr. Del Mal and his research team in 2005. When four young women developed acute psychiatric symptoms with seizures, memory deficits, diminished consciousness, autonomic instability, and hypoventilation in association with the presence of an ovarian teratoma. In a study of 100 people, most patients diagnosed are young women, but the disorder can occur in women and children also. In fact, as healthcare providers are becoming more educated about the disorder, the number of pediatric cases has steadily grown and now represents about 40% of all cases. Symptoms of anti-NMDA receptor encephalitis begin and end in a very long process, but most patients experience viral-like symptoms feeling like they may have the flu. They may have alterations in memory, behavior, and cognition. They may experience psychosis, seizures, abnormal or impaired voluntary movement, in arms, legs, or face, accompanied by autonomic and breathing instability. Most adults are first seen by, a psych by psychiatric services and can be misdiagnosed with acute psychotic disorder or drug abuse. Most children are brought to, a medical, brought to medical attention because of changes in mood, behavior, or personality, seizures, or language deterioration. Unbalanced autonomic functions are a common failure in, feature in adults with about 50% of patients developing central hypoventilation, which can be described as shallow or slowed breathing, causing a buildup of carbon monoxide. This requires weeks of mechanical support. Some patients suffer severe cardiac arrest, resulting in death or dysrhythmias, requiring a pacemaker. Symptoms of autonomic dysfunction in children are usually pres presented through urinary incontinence and sleep dysfunction. As for Susanna, she grew up with two very loving parents who had divorced when she was young. She was closer with her mother, but she had an unspoken bond with her father. Both of her parents were remarried <clears throat> to very kind and respectable people. Her boyfriend was a very supportive and significant part of her life, and she really loved him. She had a responsible older brother who was away at college when Susanna's illness started. Susanna describes herself as being a very kind and considerate woman who had always valued her independence. She was a skilled and articulate writer and was very comfortable in her career as a reporter for the New York Post. One of Susanna's first symptoms was paranoia, and that quickly escalated to delusions of reference and paranoid ideations. Her co-workers and friends had grown increasingly worried about Susanna as her behavior and paranoia became more erratic and unpredictable. Because of her intense nausea, she had lost all interest in eating and she lost weight, rapidly. In the process of trying to find a diagnosis, she was diagnosed with seizures. She was also told that she was drinking too much alcohol and she was put on an antipsychotic and given a medication to treat seizures. She had a lot of testing done, including blood work, MRIs, and even a spinal tap that just showed a slightly elevated uh, level of white blood cells. It, they really didn't prove much, and she ended up in the hospital epileptic unit and was under 24-hour monitoring. Several neurologists worked together, and one suggested a spinal tap. The result of that second spinal tap showed a major increase in those white blood cells that were only slightly elevated in the first spinal tap. This told the doctors that she probably had cere cerebral swelling. 
Su Susanna was given a cocktail treatment that included steroids, intravenous I immunoglobin, otherwise known as IVIG, and plasma exchange. She received a second dose of IVIG treatment later, but still, she had no real answers to what was wrong with her. Her symptoms had mimicked so many other disorders. Most patients with anti-NMDA receptor autoimmune encephalitis have abnormal cerebral spinal fluid results with large amounts of lymphocytic ampliocytosis, which is a sign of infection or inflammation within the nervous system. It is also seen in a number of neurological diseases. About one-third of those diseases have increased proteins, and about 60% have bands of immunoglobins, which are antibodies. The antibodies are proteins produced by plasma cells, and they're used to identify and neutralize pathogens, such as bacteria and viruses. In the early stages of this disease, about half of the patients with abnormal MRI findings, most commonly in uh, cerebral cortex or medial, medial temporal lobes, Movement disorders are also common and can be misdiagnosed as seizures. Mo most movements of the extremities are involuntary, such as dystonia, rigidity, severe hyperextension, and spasticity, creating tense postures. In most patients, the EEG shows slow or disorganized activity without epileptic activity. The diagnosis of anti-NMDA receptor autoimmune encephalitis is confirmed by the detection in serum, or CSF, which is cerebral, cerebral spinal fluid, of antibodies to the NR1 subunit of the NMDA receptor. After treatment or in the late stages of the disease, the CSF antibodies usually remain elevated if there is no clinical improvement, but serum antibodies may be significantly decreased by treatments. The titer of CSF antibodies appears to correlate more closely with the clinical outcome. A little over half the patients have an associated tumor. Most common is an ovarian teratoma that can be mistaken for a benign cyst. The detection of an ovarian teratoma is age dependent. In approximately half of female patients under 18 years old have ovarian teratomas, but fewer than 9% of girls younger than 14 have a teratoma. The discovery of a tumor is rare in male patients, but can happen in the reproductive organs. Other tumor types in some isolated cases have included teratoma in the spaces between organs, small cell lung cancer, Hodgkin's lymphoma, neuroblastoma, black breast cancer, and germ cell tumor of the testes. Susanna's team of doctors used their resources to make sure that her test samples ended up in the hands of Dr. Del Mal, the one who had studied about those four women in 2005. In the meantime, her neurologist, Dr. Najar, conducted a clock test on her. This test was a simple cognitive test, and it only required her to draw a clock with a pen and paper. Looking at the finished product, all the numbers were crammed onto the right side of the clock. This indicated to Dr. Najar that Susanna had swelling on the right side of her brain. He immediately suggested that she get a brain biopsy. Susanna had stated in her book, in her own words, if it took so long for one of the best hospitals in the world to get to this step, how many other people were going untreated diagnosed with a mental illness, or condemned to a life in a nursing home or a psychiatric ward. That's true. With this disease, accurate and timely diagnosis is crucial to treatment if the best possible outcomes are expected. Over 20% of patients diagnosed with this disease are left permanently disabled, and 4% of them diagnosed die even when diagnosed quickly. Susanna was treated with strong steroids, IVIG treatment, and plasmapheresis, which is a type of blood filtering. Her condition then went in reverse order, and she experienced all of those horrible symptoms again, including psychosis and hallucinations. That reaction is typical in the recovery of this disease. She continued several different therapies and medications for many months. She eventually worked her way back into society with many struggles to feel comfortable. When she did go back to work, she wrote an article for the Post called Month of Madness. She was invited to her neurologist, Dr. Najar's home, to meet his family. 
As a result of the article she wrote, the Syrian ambassador of the United Nations forwarded her article to a Syrian news agency, and other news media began to cover the issue. Relapses of anti-NMDA receptor autoimmune encephalitis occur in 20 to 25 percent of patients, with the risk of relapse associated with the presence of or absence of a tumor and the timing of therapy. Patients with tumors who receive tumor treatment and immunotherapy within four weeks of the beginning of neurological symptoms had fewer neurological relapses and better overall outcomes than patients without tumors or patients with tumors that, are, that were treated later or not at all. Relapses can signify the presence of recurrent tum tumors but can be independent of tumor activity. Given the severity of symptoms and prolonged hospitalizations required by some patients, the frequently positive outcomes are rewarding. In a series of 100 patients with anti-NMDA receptor autoimmune encephalitis with a median follow-up of 17 months, 47 had a full recovery and 28 had mild deficits, 18 had severe deficits, and 7 patients had an illness-related death. Residual symptoms are often behavioral and long-term follow-ups show that these residual symptoms continue to improve, improve with time. As with Susanna, she was 90% restored and was left with very minute residual symptoms. Recommendations for treatment come from research on a large series of patients with anti-NMDA receptor autoimmune encephalitis and are based on data supporting a pathogenic role of the antibodies in these disorders. Despite the severity of symptoms, most patients will respond to treatment, but, re but recovery can be slow and symptoms may relapse. Spontaneous recoveries have also been described in a few patients after several months of severe symptoms. In adults, immunotherapy with strong steroids and intravenous immunoglobin, the IVIG, should be started as soon as the diagnosis is confirmed, most likely starting with a five-day concurrent dosing schedule. Plasma exchange can substitute for IVIG even though it poses some risk to autonomic instability in some patients and is difficult to administer in uncooperative or combative patients due to their illness. For patients in whom no tumor is found at initial diagnosis, yearly surveillance for two to three years and drug therapy is recommended for one year at recovery because of the increased risk of relapses in this group. Patients may require pro prolonged stays with mechanical ventilation in intensive care units. As they recover, many will have symptoms of frontal lobe dysfunction, such as poor attention and planning, impulsivity, behavioral disinhibition, and memory deficits, which do improve over months. During this time, patients need a multidisciplinary team approach, including physical rehabilitation and psychiatric management, and as always, a strong family support system is beneficial in recovery. Susanna has gone on to write about the disease, participate in lectures, and has been introduced to some very prominent people. She now uses her knowledge to educate others and provide support to patients who have anti-NMDA receptor autoimmune encephalitis and their families.